eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. You may be seated. Thank you, Keith. Oh, we have really good, actually, attendance this morning based upon uh, the, the number of people I saw on the mountains this weekend uh, enjoying this holiday weekend, last one of the end of summer, uh, Labor Day. So grateful for your priority to be here today and uh, grateful to see your faces. Last Sunday, I was up at Silver Lake uh, at this little chapel up in the mountains uh, that the Plaz family has set up since 1973 to invite uh, local pastors to come up week after week to preach for those who are camping there or people drive up for the morning for that service. And what a beautiful space that is. And what a great heritage that the Plaz family has uh, in perpetuating that um, all these years, since 1973, we're really grateful. That little tiny house in the little background is where uh, Martha and I stayed the night previous. Actually, that's the outhouse. We weren't in there, <laughs> but there, there's one right behind it. You can't barely see it. Uh, and that was such a wonderful gift to us. So I'm grateful we have those kind of opportunities to connect with people that we don't often rub sh- shoulders and elbows with. And I'm so grateful also that in my absence, we have such capable, good teachers of the scriptures to uh, encourage us in ways that um, I'm not gifted in the same way. I love hearing a different voice and how God is speaking through other individuals and to bring out the scriptures. So Matthew, Hooper, thank you for last Sunday and your presentation and John for us. And uh, I still don't know the title. Blank and blanks. Hopefully you filled in your blanks. I did listen to the message last week. I know you kind of left that open-ended. How is God speaking to you? Uh, I love that uh, creativity that God has given Matthew. And uh, I am filling in those blanks for myself every single day. How is God moving in me? Well, one of the ways that God has wired me also, being this my... um, birthday weekend. I kind of gifted myself the first gift of my birthday weekend by uh, hiking 14 miles up to a remote lake, this lake in particular. I was there yesterday and uh, thinking, I'm going to hike this great distance. I found this lake in the middle of, and I looked at trailheads from every direction to make sure there was no close trailhead. They were all far away. So the odds of on a holiday weekend, I could get to this lake and just find maybe no one if I'm lucky. Uh, Because that's what I love to do, is go to these remote places. Well, I get in there, and uh, I don't have a picture to show this, uh, but I I was kind of walking around the lake to find a good place to camp and so on, as you do. And I run into this group who is there, and not only are they camping there, but they have these giant tents. They have this huge kitchen set up. Uh, They have boats in there. I'm like, where did you come from? There is no, I double, triple checked on the map. There is no trailhead that you could drive this, <laughs> come in here, right? Uh, I said, oh yeah, there's a, you didn't know there's a, there's a pack station uh, where people come in by, they'll bring your stuff in by horse and mule. I'm like, ah, oh, I missed that detail that you can, you know, but they were great. I shared the lake with them and, and they were not loud or anything. I, still, that was my view, right? So were the things I get to enjoy. And so grateful to be here on a weekend like today. It's another day to serve and be used of the Lord in however God has called us to. Which leads me to our passage today. We're in our, continuing our study in 1 John. And today's message, as you might have, we've heard this word testify or testimony uh, in today's passage 10 times. In fact, in, in John's letter, this first letter, it occurs 17 times total, 10 of them are in this passage. So you know it's an important word. John is making a point, the power of testimony. And if you're like me, uh, you mean like crime dramas, watching them on TV. Um, If you're kind of really into the dark side, like I kind of am, uh, you watch those crime documentaries on 
you know, streaming services like YouTube or whatever, and, and they really, I, I need to back off sometimes, you know, like the Spirit of God may be prompting me not to go into the details of cold cases and all of that over the years, but I find them fascinating. And one of the key things is testimony, direct evidence, people who saw something, who can verify, you know, there's actual a fingerprint or DNA evidence or whatever. This, the importance of testimony is uh, vital to declaring what is true about a certain case. And in this case, is the case for Jesus. What testimony evidence is there? And John brings that forward in this passage. But he kind of does it in ways that might seem a little odd to you and me in the language that he uses. In fact, I'll just give you a, a little bit of a heads up that the passage we're studying today and the passage we're studying next week have been a little bit of a conundrum for the church to really zero in on what is exactly John saying. And it's been that way for centuries, right? So this morning, you're in for a treat. We're going to unlock the mysteries of centuries in the scripture. Now, actually, I'm just going to go with what is the most, as a, a true uh, principle of interpreting scripture is the simplest uh, explanation is of, often the best. And I think in this case, that is true. So if you have your Bible, open up to 1 John chapter 5. You may have already had it open. And we're going to answer using testimony uh, of three witnesses, and it's end up going to be five by the time we're done, uh, to answer two questions. Now, remember, we're not talking about questions that you and I may have, though these are relevant to that. But we're answering specifically why John wrote this letter. Why, what questions is he attempting to answer by this letter? What is going on? And the two questions... They shouldn't be new to you if you've been here any length of time for the study. One is, is, is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God? The, the question here is, was he just a man? Or is he the one prophesied about in the Old Testament who is the very Son of God become flesh? Okay, that's what we mean by the first question. Is Jesus Christ the Son of God? A relevant question for us today. The second question that John is answering is, did the Son of God die on the cross? So, Here's the conundrum for the first century uh, and in the, the house churches in Ephesus where John is writing these real people is that there was a new influence coming, infiltrating uh, life and certainly the church in that era that said, Jesus, if he is the son of God, well, then he can't have had a physical body. And if he did have a physical body, then certainly if he's God, God can't die, Right? And so that became, started to become the argument of people who were starting to infiltrate the church and say, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, Jesus is either just a man and he's not God, or he's God, but he, he didn't really die on the cross. And they're trying to work their way around. And, and John was saying, it's like, no, it's vital that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And as the Son of God, his death on the cross is the only sufficient sacrifice to pay for the sins of the entire world. And if we take away either one of the, answer, the Christian answers to this, these questions, we lose Christianity altogether. That's why they're so relevant today. And so just to grab a couple verses in how John answers these questions. One is the verse that just pre precedes today's passage in verse 5. It says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You'll hear John say that many times. We've covered that many times. I won't repeat it too many times. But I'll just give you a couple more examples how he's answering these questions. John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh... Not only is the Son of God, but he became a human being, is from God. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 says, If in this the is the love of God that was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we, we might live through him. That's why it's so relevant. We do not have eternal life except that God sent his son into the world and that his death on the cross paid for our sin. This is where he says it in verse 10. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, 
Every time I see this word, I have to explain because propitiation isn't in my vocabulary. It's a learned word. And it simple, simply means that in judicial satisfaction. Is that really helpful to you? It's probably not. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that is when someone transgresses the law, there has to be a fine or a penalty paid in order to, to restore relationship or to be paid in full so that you kind of re-enter uh, e- equal status with other human beings. What I mean by that is if you crash into somebody's car, have you ever had a fender bender? We are obligated, if I'm at fault, to pay, that's the propitiation, for the damages that have incurred. If I damage somebody's property, I have to pay to get it repaired or to replace. There I am, that meets the judicial satisfaction of whatever went wrong. And so if I commit a crime like I'm stealing something, either I have to pay a fine or go to jail until I've made restitution. I've paid in full the judicial satisfaction of that crime, right? So what God is saying, what John is saying is that Jesus came and his death on the cross is the judicial satisfaction, the payment in full for our sin that we owe God. And apart from Jesus' death on the cross, our sin still remains on us. And the wages of sin is death, the Bible says, and separation from God. This is why it's so important. So if Jesus wasn't the son of God, he was just a man, well, his death doesn't really pay for all of the sins of humanity. If he is a son of God, but he wasn't human, then he's really not a representative of humanity. He has to be both the son of God come in the flesh so that his death, he really died, would pay in full for the sins of all humanity. This is hallmark to the Christian faith. And so John, in our current passage, is going to begin to, t- to testify. This makes sense. And he's done so many times already in the book. We won't review. But he's going to do it in a new way, utilizing the judicial idea of having two to three witnesses. If you have only one person saying something, um, it weighs something. But if you have two people corroborating on the same facts, well, that weighs even more. If you have three people in a court of law who are all saying the same thing about an event, well, that's probably how it happened. That's probably w- d- testifying to what actually happened. They're all saying the same thing. The guy that was running from the store was wearing a red shirt. Everybody says the same thing. Probably true, he was wearing a red shirt. So John is calling upon that, that court of law, this language, by saying, hey, there's three witnesses to testify. And in the end, there's going to be five. So hold on. The testimony of three. So let's go to our passage in in chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Here we get into some of the language that has been a little bit of a conundrum for the church over the years. And that is this. This is he, speaking of Jesus. Remember, Jesus being the Son of God, who came by water and blood. Now, we don't know what this means exactly yet. But it's important to John because he says it twice. Jesus Christ not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. This is really important. Now, he doesn't go any more to say what he means by this. So we have to understand his audience probably knew exactly what he meant, so didn't need further explanation. And if we think about the argument that John is making in his entire letter, what is the simplest explanation for what he means by these two words? What is he defining here, water and blood? Well, this should make sense to you as well in that the water and the blood stands for Jesus' baptism and his cross, him going to the cross and dying on the cross. Why do I think this? Because this is the argument that John has made all the way to this point, that God came into the world and his ministry was inaugurated at the baptism, when he was baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been proclaiming to all of the nation, saying, hey, get ready, prepare your heart, repent of all your sins, because God is sending the Messiah. He is sending the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He he makes this message known everywhere. So when Jesus came and was baptized, if you'll remember, John the Baptist said, this is the one I was telling you about. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was 
born after me, but he is before me in status because he is the son of God. And at this moment, the spirit of God came down, if you remember the scriptures, and remained on Jesus. It was a visible form, looked like a dove coming down and landing upon him. People were like, what is this? What's going on? And at this very same time, there was a voice in heaven, Matthew records, that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, these are great announcements. Of, we see the spirit of God. We see the voice of God. We see the, the testimony of John the Baptist who says, this is the guy. This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. Everybody look at him. So this is the official inauguration of Christ's ministry on earth. And the cross is the official end of his ministry on earth. Now, he lived several days after that. He taught, and then he ascended into heaven. But his earthly ministry, when you think about Jesus, begins at the baptism and ends at the crucifixion. He, when he completed the work that God has given him to do, that is pay for the sins of the world. So when you think of John's arguments, what he's made to this point, how important it is that we see that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Son of God, and that his death pays for the sins of the world, it makes the most sense when he says the water and the blood. It's not just the baptism only, but also his death on the cross. The very thing that the false teachers were saying, I don't think he really died. If that was true, he was just a man. If he didn't die, well, then the Spirit must have ascended you know, before that or something. They had these arguments that were confusing the church. Within the scope of that conundrum of, of John's church, you see why these two things are important to his testimony. He said the beginning of his ministry, the end of the ministry, two things that testify. The water and the blood represent the sum total of Christ's earthly ministry from his baptism through his redemptive work on the cross, his death. This is what John is saying. The beginning and the end of Jesus' ministry all testify, both testify to who he said he was, Jesus being the Christ, the Son of God, and his death being the propitiation for all sins, the judicial satisfaction. But there are three that testify, right? So we have water, blood, and the Holy Spirit, John says. Let's continue reading. Verse 6 through 8 says, In verse 6 it says, And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. If we keep reading, it says, For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. So when John refers to the Spirit giving testimony of the reality of Jesus' earthly ministry, that he was the Son of God and that his death pays in full for the sins of the whole, of the of all of humanity. Here's an interesting thing. I want I didn't bring this out before, but when he when he talked about the water and the blood, he used a. I'm gonna get to I'm gonna get, get a little nerdy on you. Okay, so hang with me here. The water and the blood in the Greek, the the verb associated with those is in what's called aorist tense. Aorist tense is a, referring to an event that has happened in the past but has, uh, I was going to use consequences to, that span into the present, or that there is, their effect that, of that event continues into the present. That's representative of aorist tense in the Greek. So we know, that's another argument, that the bl- water and the blood are referring to the baptism and the crucifixion, okay? Something that's happened in the past that has still present consequence to it, present effects to it to this day. But the, when he uses the word testify in this, this passage about the Spirit, it is in the present tense. So he shifts that the Spirit not only testified to Jesus at his baptism, remember when the Spirit came down and remained upon him, God himself declaring, this is my beloved Son, Jesus performing many signs and wonders all throughout his ministry, In fact, John, if you look at the Gospel of John, uh, he records seven signs that Jesus did. Now, he did way more than that. But he said seven, so that you would know that he is the Son of God. In fact, uh, put a bookmark or something in 1 John. Now turn to Gospel of John. I didn't plan on doing this, so let me see if I can find it really quick for you. It's the very end. He says this of John chapter 20 and verse 30. 
Speaking of the signs, John says, hey, there, here's seven examples. That should be plenty for you to see that the Spirit of God is testifying to the reality that Jesus is the Son using these signs. Everybody, when Jesus like fed the 5,000 or walked on water or turned water into wine and, and so on, uh, people would see that Jesus, certainly, that God is with him. No one can do these kinds of things unless God is enabling this. The Spirit of God is making testimony through these signs. So here's what John says in his gospel uh, in chapter 20, which is likely written prior to his first letter. Verse 30, chapter 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. He's already completed telling you about the seven. We're at that point in the book. But these seven are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See how the message is exactly the same as in 1 John. The Gospel of John is written to a broad audience. 1 John is written to the specific churches in Ephesus who were dealing with a particular problem. But the message is the same. These signs that John writes about in his gospel, that he was an eyewitness uh, testifying to, he says you, that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and having believed, you would have life in his name. All right, turn back to 1 John 5. This, there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three ag agree. Not only did the Spirit testify during Jesus' life, but remember the the verb is in present tense, meaning the Spirit continues to testify to this day. How do we know this? It's because you're sitting in this room. You set aside a day every week. That In fact, every day you wake up, you set your mind on who God is. Why? Because you yourself believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And having believed, you have life in his name. You are giving testimony with your very life that the Spirit is now speaking through you. The Spirit is continuing to speak through the Word of God as it is read among pulpits all over the world every single day and certainly every single church gathering. The Spirit continues to testify all throughout history and it includes all three, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And he finishes, oh, no, that finishes our passage right there. So he, he initially says where there are two or three witnesses, there's a strong testimony about the facts concerning a case. John is saying there's three witnesses you're all aware of. There's the beginning of his ministry at the, at, and the inauguration of his ministry at baptism. There is the fulfillment of his ministry as he goes to the cross. And the Spirit of God testifies all throughout Jesus' ministry that he is the Son of God, the Christ. And that Spirit continues to testify through you and through me. These are the three who testify. So, But John's not done. We have now the testimony of God as he continues. And I'm going to say the least about this because it really is in the previous statement that this statement becomes most understandable. Verse 9 says, If we receive the testimony of men, concerning a, like a court of law, we say that's legitimate. Two or three witnesses. The testimony of God is greater than men, right? For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Here's the conundrum. John doesn't ever say what that specific testimony is. It is. He alludes to it in two different ways. One, to what he's already said. God is overseeing this whole process, and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God himself is enabling Jesus to do these great miracles and to speak the truth about himself and about God and how one can be saved. God is giving his stamp of approval all throughout. But then we, you and I, continue the very testimony of the Spirit, which is the testimony of God, through our own testimony. Okay? So I'm going to move from this to our testimony. And this is really where I, I want to camp out. Because the first part of today's passage is that we theologically understand who Jesus is. This is important. We need to know he wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a man. He wasn't someone just claiming to be 
a prophet or Messiah, but he actually was the Son of God. And that we, most Christian churches, have an empty cross displayed in their midst because it symbolizes his death, his payment in full for us. And so now is our turn to testify. And this is where I want to end our time here together. I love this passage in verse 10. Whoever believes in the Son of God, you and me, has the testimony in himself or ourselves. Whoever does not believe in God has made him a liar, made God a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And here's where we end up. This is very similar to the passage we read in the Gospel of John in chapter 20 and verse 30. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son, Jesus. Whoever has a son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. It's as simple as that. That is why this message is so critical for us to understand. Because the result of what we believe about Jesus is life eternal life, a purpose in life, meaning to life. It is why we wake up every single day. It is why our heart continues to beat because we believe that God is sustaining all things by the power of his word. The fact that the sun rose in the east east, and sets in the west every single day according to the seasons and stars we can set a course on an ocean it is because God is sustaining all things by the word of his power and we as the pinnacle of his creation can have a relationship with him and that affects our entire life how we see the world around us how we interact with one another why justice is so important to us why love is such a deeply felt of emotion because it is God himself is love and we have God in us so what is our testimony how do we testify that we have the life that Jesus is who he said he was so I'm going to give you three ideas regarding this number one it's rooted in our profession of faith so not to reiterate everything we've just talked about but it's important we start here that we believe in Jesus, who is the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of God, who is the propitiation for our sins, who paid the, the penalty for our sin, who satisfied the judicial requirements of God, because we can't. We can never be good enough. We can never do enough good things. Sin has already separated us from God. We needed God's own Son to pay that penalty for us. And through faith, we have forgiveness. And we receive life eternal. So it starts with our profession of faith. That's what makes us Christians versus Muslims or or Buddhists. Christians are who believe this. This is the essential belief of every single Christian, someone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus. So number two, how do we testify that we have this life in us? It's shown through our day-to-day life of trusting God. It's every day we wake up. It's the decisions we make. It's the highs and lows we experience in the day-to-day stuff of life. It's the relationships we have. If, If you are a young person and you've placed your faith in Jesus, it's how are you growing into the next Um, uh, stage of your development. If I'm an adolescent, uh, I'm taking on more responsibilities around my house, right? I'm I'm growing in maturity and taking on, and that's not easy because I went from a a toddler who pretty much all of my food and clothing decisions were all made for me. Uh, And now I'm starting to make decisions for myself. And sometimes the decisions I want to make for myself as an adolescent doesn't always coincide with my parents who are still in authority over me. And so if I can express my faith in Jesus, God who says to an adolescent uh, to contribute to your household in a meaningful way, part of that means I'm going to 
live under the rules of my house. I don't like that. Don't like that. As an adolescent, I'm starting to learn independence. I'm, I'm, I love the decisions I make. In fact, my parents, you know, don't like their opinions. Don't like uh, them telling me what to do. In fact, the real people who are, are their opinions value are, are important to me are my peers, right? As an adolescent. This is n- a normal part of our life um, understanding as we transfer who is important to us. How do we make decisions? This is normal in life. It's good that our, our, we, there's that tension in the home. And, and it's important, but we don't, we don't like tension, right? So all of that, as parents and as adolescents in particular, we allow Jesus to come in and we um, yield our will, maybe, to another person's will. We defer to one another. If there's a, a rule about common space, I mean, just make it practical in the day-to-day. If there's rules about common space in our home, like how I keep my room or how I make sure the bathroom stays a certain way or the front room, when people come in, I, they don't start, well, I guess my kid's home, there's shoes, there's a backpack, there's a jacket, you know? Am I contributing to the needs of my household? There's, we're learning and growing. We don't like it because it, we'd, we'd rather somebody else do that for us. That's my toddler way. But in that lesson, I want to say, I want to do things for myself while you clean up after me. We're growing as a part of how our parent-child relationship. We're growing in that tension, and it's good. How do we invite Jesus into that day to day? Maybe as a parent, I want to be patient. Maybe I, I want to stay consistent, but I, I want to give you a sense of your growing independence. I want to hear your opinions. I want to hear what you're learning. I want to hear what makes sense to you. I want to know what is important to you. I'm going to love you like Jesus loves me. And as an adolescent, how do I live in a way that honors my father and my mother, which is one of the 10 commandments, right, of God. Honor your father and your mother. How does that look in my house? And sometimes that means, as as a mature person, we grow in maturity, it means that I have my own will, but sometimes in my maturity, I can set aside my will for the sake of, of another's will, right? We're growing in that. And God can, in the day-to-day, can beautifully do this. So I'm I'm kind of focusing on adolescence because we're doing youth ministry now and I'm I'm thinking in these terms and how important it is. Now I'm an adolescent and I'm at school. And now I have Jesus, but none of my peers do. Maybe only a couple of my peers do. How am I staying true to the integrity of my heart when I, I want to speak truth to my peers, yet their opinion of me really matters. How do I navigate that? God is right there with you. If I'm a, I'm a young parent and I'm raising kids, I've never had this job before, right? If I'm, this is my firstborn, they're the guinea pigs, right? We're doing our best, but in reality, uh, we're making a lot of mistakes on the way. And if you think about any parent who is not insecure about their parenting, Uh, The reality is, if you make some sort of parental suggestion to them, you know exactly how insecure they are as parents. You're going to get mama bear if you say that they're not doing a good job parenting, right? Because we all, we just want desperately to raise beautiful people, but we we have, we're learning ourselves how to do that. How our our day-to-day witness of Jesus is inviting Jesus into how we parent. Jesus, help me to be patient. Help me to accept responsibility and even ask forgiveness when I maybe set an example that I would not prefer, that I'm not really displaying your love in me when I got so frustrated with my my child over this circumstance that now that we're kind of on this side of it, I'm feeling, ah, I made too big a deal out of that. How do I move in gentleness and kindness while still saying hard but true things? It's It's a juggling match, right? while we're nurturing this insecure part of our hearts, we want our kids to turn out great. And we're realizing we have some control over that, teach a child how the way should go. In the end, they won't depart from it, but that is a, like most of the time idea. It's not a promise, right? Many of us know. Kids, when they become adults, they make their own choices. Maybe I'm a young married. I'm learning to defer to my husband or to my wife. How do I live in the same household? How do we take two really strong opinions and honor one another while still moving forward? We need Jesus 
in the day-to-day. And how it, we testify, it's in our way of grace and gentleness and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. These are all fruit of the Spirit of God actively testifying about Jesus in us. How are we doing that? We navigate the day-to-day of our life. And it's not just the, the seasons of life, but it's also the highs and the lows. Sometimes we're like, God is so good, right? When everything is going good. But when things aren't, God is desiring to teach us something deeper about himself. It's hard for us to yield to that. Oh, so hard. I want what I want on my terms and my time. And God, when you don't supply that, it's frustrating. Why on earth is this happening in my life? God, I thought I was doing the right thing. You say to honor you. I go to church. I'm, I'm reading the Bible. I'm praying. I'm giving in, in the tithes. I'm serving people. I'm doing the things. God, why is this thing in my life not working? Remember, God uses all things for his glory and to redeem even the hard things. Now remember, in Israel, when they were wandering in the desert, certainly a time of, of them wondering, what's, what's gonna, what is today going to bring? What's tomorrow going to bring? And God is teaching them in the day to day. Remember that he fed them every single day in manna. He says this. This is what the scriptures help us to say. I allowed you to become hungry so that I could feed you. I needed you to become hungry so that you would depend on me. And I could say, yeah, this is my character. I'm going to supply all your needs. Not just today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. If you just, and I'm only going to do it one day at a time because every day you have to trust me that I'm going to do it again. I'm teaching you to trust me. And then in their wanderings, another example is they came to uh, a place and they ran out of water and they're like, oh man, what, what's going, we're going to do now? We're, we're thirsty. The, the scriptures say again, I allowed you to come, become thirsty so that I could give you drink. God allows hard things in us because we need to grow in our, in our own ability to endure as well as our ability to trust God in the day-to-day. God, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to pay my bills today, this month. Man, we, we were hit by this thing, this car repair. You know, our dishwasher went out. Our garage doors stopped working. Those are real examples of our life this, in this last year. You know, it's like we're trying to save for this wedding. All of a sudden, like hit the button on the garage door and it's not opening. Oh, fill, fill up the dishwasher, hit start. It's not working. It's like, really, Lord? In the day-to-day, how are we trusting? God says, Mark, I've allowed your garage door to become broken so that you would learn to trust me. I'm not sure what the lesson is that in there yet, but it's the blank and the blank. Come back to Matthew's message. It's the blank and the blank. God, what are you teaching me today? That is our testimony, our day-to-day life of trusting God. And finally, it's the sum total of our life. Sometimes the day-to-day, as much as we are you know, experiencing the highs and the lows and the goods and the bads of life, sometimes feel really good. Hey, I'm doing good. It's a good week. I'm trusting God. But sometimes we are not very proud of our not very shiny moments in life. We're not really living out the testimony of God in us. We, ha- we must remember that our worst moments, that moment we said that thing and we were feeling passionate or we were angry or frustrated, that's not as much a definer of us as more of the sum total of our Christian life. And I'm talking about the sum total of life. I'm talking about our Christian life, right? Maybe some of you come to faith in the last month you have, how have you endeavored to trust God in a month? That's what we're talking about. That is our testimony about Jesus. Or as like me, I was raised in the church. I placed my faith in Jesus as a very young child. I've got an entire life that I can look back on and say, in those moments when I feel particularly bad about a decision or a lack of enough in my life that would maybe appease God or whatever it is that I'm not doing that sometimes I focus my attention on, I have to stop and say, Mark, how are you doing overall? 
Are you a person who loves Jesus? Yes. Oh, yes. Are you a person who is generally kind? Are you gen- someone who is, has a, a list of, of shiny moments as well as those moments you're frustrated or the moments you're not feeling so good about your performance or whatever that looks like? Oh, yeah. Keep in mind the big picture. What does the sum of our life look like? This next Saturday, September 7th, we are going to celebrate the life of Martha's father, Marty Hooper. And I think about the sum of someone's life. You really capture that in someone's memorial service, right? Especially someone like Marty Hooper. Uh, how many people remember Marty Hooper? Martha and Matthew's dad, Mark Hooper's dad. Yeah, we have a lot of Hoopers in our, in our church, Think, thankfully. We're grateful for that. Their dad, Marty. He is a, was a traveling evangelist. He was a, in full-time ministry before that, but God put a call in his life to, to go all over the world and uh, travel and preach the gospel. I met him in 1986, 7, 87. That's also when I met Martha, who would become my bride. So I got to really know Marty really well. And whatever you knew about him when he would stand up here in his big, booming voice to tell you to love Jesus and that Jesus loves you, and he'd often wear bright clothes and bright shirts that says, God loves you and so do I. He'd be known to dress up as Santa Claus when he'd travel and, and, and talk to kids and tell them about Jesus. And he went all over the world and preached to pastors and preached to those who were in the poor and the marginalized of the world and they would come to faith, sometimes by the thousands. This is a guy who is faithful a faithful example. When you think about the sum total of someone's life, when I think about Marty Hooper, I think, wow, so happy that he lived a life to do exactly what God called him to do. He hasn't called me to be a, a traveling evangelist. I don't have the same gifts as Marty. I don't have the booming voice. I don't have the personality of Marty Hooper. But boy, I loved Marty. He was such an encouragement to me. And I imagine... By the way, next Saturday, it's at 2 o'clock. Anybody, you're welcome to come to hear about this man's life and his testimony of faith, someone who lived the day to day. Not without his failings, certainly, but one who is faithful. 2 o'clock next Saturday, you're welcome to come. But as we bring it to us, how am I doing? Have I professed Jesus and my faith in Jesus? Am I endeavoring on a day-to-day to be faithful to Jesus in the things he has called me to today? Whether that's I'm a young person, an older person, whatever season of life, whatever the day that brings today, both it's things to celebrate, like a birthday, and the things that are challenging to us. Am I inviting Jesus to the day-to-day? And if we're doing that consistently, even though we have some troubling moments, over the course of the sum of our Christian life, our life will tell the story of who God is. And everyone who knows us will somehow come to know that Jesus is the Son of God. Whether they believe it or not is on them. But if they know you and you are a faithful witness of Jesus in you, God will shine through your life. If we bring the, the worship team back up, I would love for this last song for us to just take those last three statements. What do I believe about Jesus? How is Jesus showing up in the day-to-day for me? And how, and if I'm faithful to that, how is he reflected in the greater total of my Christian faith? Sometimes that's helpful when we're in a, like a low moment, right? And Yield to him afresh today. Let's stand together as we sing. It's going to be a mashup of two songs, actually, about our giving our life over afresh to allow Jesus to move in and through us because of what he's done on our behalf.